Hey everybody, in this video, I'm gonna be showing you guys the most successful and consistent way to find big woods bucks and then hunt them during the fall. It's a pretty simple strategy, but most people are still overlooking it and they're not keeping in mind the principles behind it that will year in and year out consistently put you on bucks in a big woods setting in the areas that you hunt. And stick around till the end of the video because that's when I'm gonna talk about how you're gonna know if you should be focusing on hunting that spot during a fall or if you should be passing on it and how to decipher between the two. All right, now before we get there, I do wanna give you guys my definition of what a big woods hunting condition is. And really it just boils down to any large tract of forested or wilderness type setting that doesn't have any artificial deer concentration features. For example, a food plot, or an egg field or something like that. Um, it's really just those natural expanses of cover, typically heavily forested areas. Maybe there's clear cuts, rivers, swamps, things like that interspersed, but they just don't have any of those artificially high concentrated uh, deer populations in them. All right, now where I wanna start with this video is I'm gonna start rolling photos right now of one of my mock scrapes up in Northern Minnesota in a big chunk of public land. This is a big woods setting and I want you guys to watch these photos and think about what you notice. What are you seeing right now? We're seeing some bucks roll by, we're seeing some does roll by, some fawns. This is an entire year's worth of photos condensed down uh, quickly just showing you um, a lot of photos very quick and in the area where this camera is rolling it's an area where we deer hunt there are zero to ten deer per square mile according to the Minnesota DNR so very very low deer densities in this area and there are some wolves in this area up in the northern part of the state want you guys what are you noticing in these pictures right now one thing that jumps out at me is there are a lot of does using this mock scrape. And that's something that doesn't get talked about a whole lot, but that's really the central focus of today's video. The entire strategy that we need to apply here if we wanna consistently find bucks in a big woods setting is it revolves around a primary scrape. Now, a primary scrape is any scrape in the woods that gets used by, uh, or it gets used multiple times throughout a fall by multiple different bucks and multiple different does. That's a key distinguishing feature, you guys. So a lot of us have found scrapes in the woods. Some of them are one-time use scrapes. And a lot of times you'll notice that it's, it's real triangular in shape. A buck just kicked it open in a fit of, you know, rutting rage and he's just crashing his way through the woods, ripping open these little scrapes all over the place. I'm not talking about those. Those are one-time use. Those are day use scrapes. I'm talking about a primary scrape, one that has multiple deer using it throughout the fall. And you're gonna know it's a primary scrape. Some people call them community scrapes, whatever you wanna call them. You're gonna know you found one by monitoring it with your trail camera. And when you see those multiple bucks coming through and multiple does, you know that you've now found a primary scrape. Now, what's important about these primary scrapes is where they exist and why. John Eberhardt, he's a famous whitetail hunter from Michigan. He shot a lot of record book bucks. He originally brought this up and he said something that really struck me and I've pondered it over the years and I've found it to be highly true in the areas that I hunt. He said that scrapes always exist wherever there are doe family groups. And another way to think of it is that scrapes don't exist in nature. Bucks don't create them in voids or areas where there are no does or areas where they don't plan to, to set up their breeding area. It really made sense to me. And when, when I first heard that, I thought, no, that can't be. But the more you start to test this theory, the more I started to realize how much truth there is to it that those scrapes always exist in the presence of doe family groups. They're delineating and representing an area that has an elevated number of does. I call them doe zones, some people call them doe family groups, it's all the same thing. And especially in a big wood setting, you can think of it this way, if you find does, there likely will be a primary scrape nearby. Or conversely, if you find that primary scrape, that likely means you're in the presence of an elevated doe family group area or a doe zone area. 
So the big question becomes, how do we find one of these areas? This is great to talk about it, but at the end of the day, if we can't put it into action and actually find one, this does us no good. So the kind of areas that I'm gonna be starting if I'm just scouting, looking for a new hunting location, I'm gonna be looking around newer clear cuts, even middle-aged clear cuts in these big expansive tracts of public land, these big wood settings. I'm gonna look at ash swales. I'm gonna look at young pine plantations or anywhere where there's a transition between high ground and low ground. Seams of cover, cover transition, places where there's converging cover types. And, and then also another really good area to look and places where I've found them is in like a grassy pocket or sort of a semi-open, uh, we call them frost pockets. I don't think that's actually what causes them, but just uh, little grassy pockets and openings in the woods in, surrounded by areas of dense cover. So again, these primary scrapes are not gonna show up randomly or by accident. The bucks won't do that. They're too survival driven. These primary scrapes are always gonna show up in the presence of doe family groups. And I'll be honest with you guys, they're not easy to find. They're not all over out in the woods. In the areas where we gun hunt up in northern Minnesota, um, you know, I have one stand location right now. Actually, the, the stand location where I showed you guys those photos earlier in this video, that has had a consistent primary scrape on it for the last five or more years. And there's something about that area that those bucks consistently want to utilize that scrape on. And it's got many converging cover types but the truth of it is that they're very few and far between up there. There's just very few deer up there to begin with. And that's why it's so important to find these. If you can't find them, you can make a mock scrape, but the whole trick there is it has to get adopted by the deer. If it doesn't get adopted, it's not gonna do you any good during the fall. You can't just put the scent out, build the mock scrape and assume they will come. It doesn't work that way. Mock scrapes only pull back the curtain and reveal what was already occurring in that area. If you set up a mock scrape, you're not gonna create a doe family group, a doe zone, and then you know those satelliting bucks. You can't create that with a scrape alone. In the big woods, public land settings, mother nature has to create it first. If you set up that mock scrape because you find the convergence of deer trails, lots of fresh droppings, tracks, and you know that you're in a doe family zone area, and you create that mock scrape, then it will likely work. But it has to work in that order. The does have to be there first. There has to be food sources there for the does and reasons why they're there in the first place. Then comes the mock scrape. It doesn't work in reverse order. And now the big takeaway from this video, you guys, and one thing that it's taken me many years of grinding away on public land, on big woods settings where we gun hunt up in the northern part of the state, it's taken me many, many years to learn this and I'm gonna share this with you guys and it's probably the most important part of this whole video is that what we've found is that a mock scrape or a primary scrape that starts out hot, if you've got a trail camera monitoring it, if that mock scrape or primary scrape starts the fall out hot, meaning it's getting hit by multiple bucks in late September, early October, mid-October, it tends to stay that way through the rut and during the gun season. However, if that mock scrape or primary scrape starts out cold and in the month of October you get few, if any, deer using it, it tends to stay that way throughout the rut, throughout the gun season. And you can really apply this um, almost with total accuracy. You know, I, there, it seems like there's always an exception to every rule, but on all of the public land areas that, that I hunt, this even applies to ag country and areas near food plots. If that scrape starts the fall out hot, it stays hot. If it starts the fall out cold, it stays cold throughout the rest of the rut. And that's a really important takeaway. And I hope you guys can use that in your scouting coming up this spring and then this coming fall. Hopefully use this strategy to put yourself right in the driver's seat in those big woods settings and in those public land conditions where you've got to really fight and grind to get those buck encounters, this is the most successful and consistent strategy you can use to find deer. Can you hunt a remote funnel of some sort in the big woods too and kill a buck? Yeah, of course you can. 
This video is just geared towards the best and most consistent way to get on bucks during the rut, during the fall in those big woods settings. So with that, you guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you apply some of these concepts where you're at. And until next time, take care.